to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 208th episode, our guest is John Leshy. John Leshy became deeply involved with America's public lands soon after his graduation from Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He was solicitor for the U.S. Department of Interior from 1993 to 2001 and is co-author of the Standard Textbook on Public Land and Resources Law. Federal Public Land and Resources Law, and has written and lectured widely on public lands. He is Emeritus Professor at the University of California, Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. His new book, Our Common Ground, A History of America's Public Lands, will be published February 8, 2022, by Yale University Press. And now, on to the show. Sure, I'm John Leshy. Uh and I'm a emeritus professor at University of California, Hastings College of the Law, and I've written a book called Our Common Ground that is going to be published by Yale Press in a couple of months. Yeah, and uh, like I said, it takes a real uh, large scope. Uh, As you mentioned, other books have tackled tackled a similar uh, issue as far as public lands, but never kind of with this kind of scope. Would that be fair to say? Yes, I think so. I mean, there have been, you know, there have been lots of things written about the America's public lands over the years, uh, uh, focusing on things like a particular national park or national forest or the national forest system or something like that. But looking at the big picture and all of the lands, uh, there are more than 600 million acres. That's a lot of territory. Uh, there hasn't been a book like this in many decades. Uh, actually, never, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... If you could talk a little bit about your background, though, because I know your previous experience uh, probably definitely p- played a role in your interest in this topic uh, in the first place, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I have been uh, uh, I've dealt with the public lands uh, for my entire professional career going back a, a half a century. Uh, I worked for about 12 years in the uh, Interior Department in Washington, which manages many of these lands, and I look, served on a congressional committee that uh, deals with these lands, and I've been a teacher, professor, an author, and, and an advocate in some areas. So I've pretty much devoted my professional life to the public lands. Um, and whenever I have talked about them uh, and lay out the, the facts that, you know, uh, it's how remarkable it is that in a in a nation where um, <clears throat> uh, that loves private property and and distrusts government, particularly the national government, uh, how remarkable it is that the national government owns and manages about thirty percent of the real estate in the country. Uh, not only that, but it generally holds these lands open to all and manages them primarily for conservation, recreation, and education. Um, And uh, so it's really one of America's greatest assets. But when you describe the extent of these lands, uh, most people react the same way, which is, I had no idea. How did that happen? And so I decided after hearing that response a lot that I ought to write a book and tell the story of how how it happened that America came to uh, have all these lands in national ownership and managed for these broad public purposes. Right, definitely. And then um, since your book kind of does move through the years chronologically here, I I thought it might be useful to start at the beginning. Um, You talk about the nation's founding and the public lands, uh, and uh, it was interesting to see the maps that you have in the book that kind of show the large uh, areas in the, I guess, what was considered the West at that point of just this large thing belongs to this tiny state that borders the ocean on this side and may not even touch it. So uh, talk a little bit about those early years of of public lands, because I thought that was interesting. Sure. Uh, You know, uh, we we all know that America started out with these 13 original colonies uh, along the eastern seaboard, uh, and they all had charters from uh, the King of England. Uh, And these charters varied a lot in terms of how they described the western boundaries of these particular colonies. And so some colonies like Maryland had a fixed western boundary, and uh, other colonies like Virginia had a kind of an open-ended western boundary, which went from sea to sea. So Virginia had a claim to basically a lot of lands west of the Appalachians, and Maryland and other colonies didn't have claims to any. 
And this was a huge dispute right at the very founding of the nation. Uh, and it held up the ratification of the so-called Articles of Confederation, which was the first organizing document for the new government. So in other words, the United States got off to a very rocky start because the states couldn't agree because of this dispute over the extent of Western land claims of some of the colonies. And so eventually uh, this dispute was settled because by the colonies with the Western land claims like Virginia, ceding those claims and those lands to the national government. And that was the, the, the pact, the peace treaty basically, that allowed the United States actually to be formed. And so it was formed by the United States taking control of these Western lands. And that started the very institution of public land holding. Right. And then, um, you know, I think there was an understanding, at least from what I read in your book, uh, that a lot of these places would later become states governed by themselves. And that was part of what allowed some of these uh, dis disputes to be settled, at least for the moment, in that, you know, this will be a, a sovereign state or not, you know, it will be a state anyway that's governing itself eventually. We're just not going to like, <laughs> well, I'm, I live in Indiana. So what was the state that controlled that? Uh, I forget which one it was. It was some eastern state. <laughs> well, Virginia and yes. uh, Connecticut and actually right. a couple of other eastern states had had claims to Indiana. <laughs> right, right. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's just funny to think that that was that was the way it was right at the initial part here. But you talk about how they they started um, divvying these lands up into kind of grids, right? That was one of the first uh, innovations, I guess, that they had uh, as far as mapping and and kind of figuring out just these wide swaths of land. Yeah, I mean the the objective in the early days of the republic uh, was to settle these lands. Uh, in a way that would keep the United States united. Uh, you know, the fear was that, that settlers would go to the Western lands and set up independent countries that would compete with the United States. Mm. So that was the, the fear that the founders uh, had to uh, deal with. And so the way they dealt with it was to uh, basically say that as these lands are settled, new states shall be admitted out of these lands when, they, when the areas reach a certain population. And these new states would basically be equivalent to the older states. And so that was the, the kind of pact that allowed the United States to grow and remain unified as it grew, because that was a very big concern. And it succeeded very well, as we all know. Uh, the United States extended gradually across the country to the Pacific, and it stayed together as, uh, as a single entity. And the process of settling these lands with the people from Europe, from European extraction, um, was a big focus of the early public land policy. Uh, and uh, so it involved surveying the lands in, and dividing them up into parcels and then giving the parcels away or putting the parcels on the market and selling them. Uh, and so in the early days, the effort was mostly we need to uh, uh, transfer these lands into private ownership in order to, in a way that will keep the United States united. Uh, now, a hundred years later or so, in the latter part of the 19th century, the United States began a, a kind of a different tactic because it was clear the country was going to be united and extended across the, the nation to the Pacific. And California had been admitted to the Union in 1850 after the gold rush and all of that. Uh, then the United States began to think, well, we should keep some of these lands for and manage them in the national interest. And that process began after the Civil War and in a big way in about 1890. So my book focuses on the period uh, really from 1890 on when the United States launched this big effort to keep the many of these lands in national ownership. Um, so yes, the, the nation is expanding all through that. However, there are Native people already here and you know they you know you can tell someone that <laughs> this is the land is is part of this other thing but it's like well we're already here and then there, there's of course a conflict to that so um you're kind of saying that this this uh, system got really going in in the later part of the 19th century that kind of also coincides with the kind of final uh, defeats of a lot of the major uh, tribes so can you talk a little bit about the interaction of these public lands and, and native americans a little bit yes absolutely um now, my, my book does not deal 
uh, at any length with the complex story of how how the European invaders mm -hmm. uh, and their successor, the United States, uh, dispossessed the Native Americans from their lands and acquired formal title to their lands. That process was very complicated and took many decades, actually centuries counting the European nations. Uh, and it certainly had more than its share of injustice and, and dishonorable behavior, frankly, by the United States government. Um, it was usually triggered by settlers and miners and speculators and developers basically rushing out and, and essentially throwing the Indians uh, off the lands they had traditionally occupied. And then uh, the government came along and formally acquired that land uh, through treaties and other agreements, uh, mm -hmm. usually with some kind of compensation, although very generally speaking, not adequate uh, compensation. Mm -hmm. My book doesn't deal with that because it's, it's really a separate story mm -hmm. um, and it's been dealt with in many other books. Likewise, my book does not really address in any detail how the United States came to acquire large amounts of territory from Great Britain, from Spain, from France, from Mexico, from Russia, in the case of Alaska, mm -hmm. and through conflicts and, and deals like the Louisiana Purchase. That, again, is a separate story. That all took place really before the, my story started, which is the story of how the United States came to hang on to these lands it acquired from the, the Indians and from these foreign governments. And like I said, that started in in a big way in about 1890. And that was after mm -hmm. the Indians had been moved off and moved on to reservations set aside for them and, and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and another subject that kind of comes up, obviously, before the end of the 19th century is the topic of slavery. And at this time, of course, we have uh, you know, expansion and in, in towards the West, and there's this policy of, you know, admitting one slave state and then a free state uh, back and forth, kind of like that, to keep it uh, separate but equal, I guess, is the terminology that would have been used. But but how, how does uh, the public lands figure into this? Because obviously you have people of both persuasions, anti and pro-slavery, uh, you know, rushing into these areas and, you know, bringing their ideas with them. So obviously that's a source of conflict uh, growing forward, I assume. Yeah. Well, the uh, slavery was tied up with public land policy before the Civil War in a in an interesting uh, way, because, like you said, the the initial policy was to sort of admit a, a slave state and admit a free state and keep the the national government balanced in that respect. That was the famous Missouri Compromise in 1819. Uh, but in the 1840s and 1850s, as the abolitionist movement uh, gained power uh, to simply abolish the institution of slavery, uh, the Supreme Court uh, stepped in <clears throat> and issued a couple of decisions, with, uh, frankly, bizarre decisions, which basically said the United States had no constitutional power over public lands mm. uh, and couldn't could not determine uh, that a state could be admitted as a free state. Um, they overthrew the Missouri Compromise in a in a frankly a, a kind of a made up decision. That was the famous Dred Scott case. Most people have heard something about Dred Scott. Well, mm -hmm. in the Dred Scott case, the Supreme Court adopted a view of the Constitution that they had never really adopted before and have never uh, approved it since, uh, which was to say the United States has really no power over public lands. Uh, now, that made the Civil War inevitable, basically. And mm -hmm. that was four years, five years before the, the secession and the Civil War. So the Civil War settled the slavery que question. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the, the, the national power to hold and manage lands has not been questioned since by the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. And, uh, you know, going forward after the Civil War, you talk about how, you know, these people that see this vast swath of natural resources just sitting there are, are certainly licking their chops trying to get to it. Um, talk a little bit about the speculation and the uh, kind of, uh, obviously, this is an issue that still is with us today, of course, right? I mean, there's uh, all sorts of uh, people trying to get at public lands still to this day, but obviously there wasn't a national park system to speak of back then, so... Right. I mean, the as 
the the policy of settling the West uh, continued certainly after the Civil War. Uh, in fact, it, it sort of accelerated after the Civil War because during the Civil War, the the United States Congress, after the Southern states seceded, uh, adopted some very important laws. One was the Homestead Act, which basically said opened up many federal lands, public lands, to uh, farming, that if you could go out and make a living farming a, a particular tract of land, you could get title to it for free. That's the homestead idea. And that was enacted in 1862. At the same time, almost simultaneously, Congress began a process of giving away vast amounts of public lands to railroads to build transcontinental railroads. The first one, again, approved in 1862, the next one in 1864. And for the next seven years, uh, Congress gave away a vast amount of land, 100 million acres or more, to public to, to railroads to, to build uh, transcontinental railroads to stitch the nation, keep the nation together. Uh, that policy was much criticized because it really gave the railroads enormous power over a vast territory of the country. Uh, and was eventually, there was a backlash. Congress stopped the practice in 1871. And, uh, and in 1890, Congress said, well, wait a minute, we're going to start keeping some of these lands. We're not going to give them all away because we fear that if we give them all away, uh, that, you know, very rich people and very rich corporations are going to end up controlling all those lands and not letting ordinary people uh, have access to them. So the, the policy change to uh, start keeping public lands in national ownership and manage them for the, for the broad public purposes came about in part as a reaction to the sort of excesses of these railroad land grants and, and other giveaways like that. And, you know, this was in an era that uh, Mark Twain wrote a book about called The Gilded Age. And so we now know that era from 1870 to the 1890s as this Gilded Age, which was, interestingly enough, characterized by, among other things, a very wide disparity in income and wealth among the American people. There was a very thin slice of people at the top who had enormous amounts of money, and then when there were, most people didn't have much money. Uh, a situation in terms of the way the economists look at it, uh, not very different from what we see today, where we have enormous income uh, inequality. Well, back then, there, one of the reactions to the inequality was to say, look, we're going to stop giving these lands away because the plutocrats are going to keep it all and put up no trespassing signs. And so we need to keep some of these lands, many of these lands that are remaining in national ownership, in national ownership. Uh, now that all took place in the West. Eventually, it was beginning in, 19, in 1890, created the, what we now know as the National Forest System. Uh, Congress gave the president in 1891 the power to reserve public lands in so-called forest reserves. Um, and, and, the, and presidents, Republican and Democrat, over the next 20 years, created the national forest system through these forest reserves, these executive orders reserving the public lands and national ownership. Interestingly, about the same time, a, a, a lag of a little bit, but in 1911, Congress passed another major law called the Weeks Act, which authorized the United States to acquire lands from willing sellers in other parts of the country to establish a, a national forests in the East and the South and the Midwest. Um, and so that began the practice of uh, adding to the national land base by buying lands back that the United States uh, had either given away or had never owned because uh, they had belonged to the 13 colonies and were privatized. So all the national forests you see, and I think you have one in Indiana, uh, and certainly there are some in the Appalachians and in the South and in the mid upper Midwest. Those were all acquired by the United States, paid for by cash um, um, under the so-called Weeks Act. Um, there are also, as you know, many national parks in the East, uh, uh, Mammoth Cape, Great Smokies, uh, Big Bend in Texas. Those were also acquired and in some cases, many cases actually, the states bought the land from private owners and donated it to the national government 
uh, for those purposes. The Everglades, Big Bend uh, are good examples of that. Uh, so the public lands in the east uh, and the south and the Midwest came about by a somewhat different process of acquisition that began about the same time that the United States was reserving the lands it already owned permanently in national ownership uh, in the West. Mm -hmm. um, I talk a little bit also as this process is happening of how people think about the animals that live in these places, because um, obviously, you know, we're, we're it's, it's uh, the Wild West, literally. And then we're moving into a, an era of more regulation. Um, talk a little bit about what policy changes and, and kind of ways of thinking that people had about the animals that lived there. Okay, good, good question. Uh, and an important part of the public land story. Um, and, it, and it developed about the same time that I've been talking about, 1890s, early 1900s. Um, this was an era when um, uh, concern about wildlife losses was beginning to bubble up in a big way, driven by a couple of big episodes that most people have some familiarity with. One is the destruction of the bison. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention that big uh, photo. You ever seen that photo of the just the mountain of bison? Yes. In school? Oh, it's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. Tens <laughs> of millions of bison were slaughtered uh, and almost wiped out. I mean, mm -hmm. Within 20 years, uh, largely driven by the Transcontinental Railroad building, because it was going through the areas where the bison were most populous, uh, and they were just slaughtered willy-nilly, and, and we almost lost them. I mean, at, mm -hmm. uh, by the early 1900s, there were only a few hundred left, in mm -hmm. mostly in a national park, as it happened. Uh, the other thing that happened, uh, slaughter, was the passenger pigeon. Again, billions of birds, and they were totally wiped out. The last passenger pigeon died in, uh, in a zoo in 1911, I think, or 1915. Um, well, those episodes kind of woke people up that, geez, you know, wildlife are not, uh, uh, we have some responsibility if we want to keep. Uh, and so the public lands were used as a way to protect wildlife habitat and keep um, uh, wildlife uh, that we wanted to preserve, keep, keep them around, keep them alive. Um, and so starting right around 1900, um, the first wildlife, what became known as wildlife refuges, were established. And over the next several decades, um, uh, millions of acres of land was held permanently in public ownership, uh, in specifically for wildlife purposes. Now, today, practically all of the 600 million acres of public lands uh, are managed in part to preserve wildlife. That's a very important function for um, uh, for the public lands just about everywhere. Uh, and uh, hunting is, sport hunting is permitted on, on many of those lands. That's a big recreational activity. Um, and uh, we have in the Midwest, for example, uh, uh, and I think you have a wildlife refuge or two in, in uh, Indiana, if I'm not mistaken, um, we have uh, a, a sort of chains of, of wildlife refuges extending north and south along what are called flyways, where the migratory birds tend to travel. And so we have these sort of, this, it's sort of like a system of motels for, for migratory birds uh, so to sustain their migrations from uh, the Arctic down to the Gulf Coast and, and places in Central and South America. So um, wildlife refuges and, and wildlife protection is an important function for many public lands. Definitely. And, uh, you know, you talk about this time period, and of course, uh, one of the major figures in the time period you're most focused on is uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, um, who was also a big hunter. So it's it's kind of interesting that, you know, he he was so interested in the land, but he also uh, kind of thought of it in a certain kind of way. So talk a little bit about what the impact of his uh, presidency had on public lands, because obviously it was huge. Yes, he was um, a definitely a, a major player, but but by 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 no means uh, was he alone. Uh, and mm. one of the points I, I try to make in the book is, you know, people some people think, well, it was all the responsibility of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, it, it was not. Theodore Roosevelt was a big player. But there were many other players uh, as well. Uh, but he he came along at the sort of at the right time when all these issues were 
were bubbling up. And he was a naturalist. Uh, he had written books about birds. He was also a sport hunter, uh, took that very seriously. Um, and as were, as were many advocates for wildlife preservation during that time, were, were active hunters. That was just part of the, part of the deal. Um, and, uh, and hunters have uh, continued to be a, a big force uh, for conservation of, of public lands uh, yet today. So Theodore Roosevelt used his authority that Congress had given him to uh, over the public lands to set aside the first area specifically devoted to wildlife. He also accelerated the expansion of the national forest system, whose purposes include wildlife uh, protection. Uh, and so he had a he had a big impact. Um, but as I said, by all means, by, by no means was he. Uh, the only um, uh, actor in this drama. There were many of them. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the one of the major points I, I try to make in this book is that this process throughout American history of setting aside and protecting public lands for broad public uses was a bipartisan or nonpartisan process. Uh, you know, today we're sort of accustomed to thinking of all public policy issues is where the, you know, it's red and blue and it's Republican and Democrat and you line up on opposite sides and that's the way things happen. In the public lands area, that was never the case. Uh, so you have Theodore Roosevelt, a Republican, being a big advocate for protecting public lands. You have his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, a Democrat, also being a big advocate for protecting uh, public lands. And on and on, I can give you the book. The book gives you countless examples of where people reached across the aisle and these issues were never regarded as pub Republican issues or Democratic issues. They were always uh, resolved and worked out on, on a bipartisan or nonpartisan basis. And they were also worked out uh, largely on a uh, on a national basis. Uh, I mentioned the Weeks Act earlier, which was the big act that launched the program of acquiring eastern and midwestern and southern lands for national forests. Um, um, when that Weeks Act was going through Congress, the governors of many states in the South and North all testified before Congress in support of the act. We want this. We want this. We want the national government to come in and buy these lands. And the governor of Massachusetts in one of these hearings said, you know, this is the first time uh, in American history where governors of southern states and northern states have testified before Congress in support of something that's good for the common welfare everywhere. And that's a really that, that's a, an important point about the public land story, that it is unifying and it has always been these issues have always been handled and resolved on a on a bipartisan or nonpartisan basis. That's one of the reasons I named the book Our Common Ground, because in fact, that's what the public lands are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely interesting to think of it like that, because you're right, It's uh, everything does kind of line up one or the other, and, and this is something that people have kind of agreed upon, at least uh, until recently, uh, of course. But um, it, it kind of reminds me of what people have said about libraries. It's like if you if you if libraries didn't exist now and somebody just proposed the idea they that you'd get a million reasons why that would never work. You know, what I, mean? <laughs> right. I, I feel like public lands are the same way. Like if they didn't already exist, it'd be like, what we have a then they're not going to do anything with it. You're just going to sit there. And then it's like <laughs> be hard to explain to uh, somebody that wasn't familiar with it, what, what that was all about. But um, well, that's little, right. And, and right. <laughs> there's another related point I would make and, and I, I make in the book over and over. The, the, there is a kind of a uh, one of the many misconceptions or myths about public lands history uh, is that the, the United States got these lands uh, with a land grab over the opposition of local communities and, and states. Um, again, that is not how it happened. These lands, these decisions to keep these lands in national ownership were almost always made with the support uh, and the advocacy of the of the states and the local communities. The National Forest System is a good example. Uh, while Theodore Roosevelt and other presidents in his era uh, 
signed a lot of orders creating forest reserves, they almost always did that upon petition by local areas. The local areas wanted the national government to set aside these lands uh, and ask for it to be done. And so this was not a land grab uh, by the feds over local opposition, just the opposite. Uh, you know, the, the, the myth, uh, you saw the myth, you know, uh, a few years ago when there was this crackpot group that took over a national wildlife refuge in, in Oregon uh, mm. for a couple of weeks and said, you know, we want those lands back. They were stolen from us, you know, by the feds, et cetera. That, that's just wrong. It, it, history does not support that at all. And this is the, and bun the, the Bundys, the Eamon yeah. Bundy. Is that? Yeah, yeah. right, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a popular myth, I'm sure, on on that side. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, talk, yeah, as you, you talked about uh, these uh, public lands and the national park system getting going here in in the late 19th and the early 20th century, uh, how did that evolve during its uh, early kind of formative years? Because this is a this is a big change, and things are being codified that were not really codified before. So how did, but you know, kind of pre-World War II, how were things shaping up in those early years? Uh, are you talking about national parks in particular? Yeah, nat uh, national parks in particular, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the parks uh, have a, a little bit different history, although the broad outlines are the same. The first national park um, was established at Yellowstone in 1872. Uh, Congress had actually set aside what I kind of consider the real first national park, in Yosemite in California in 1864. But what Congress did then was, because California was far away, uh, travel being difficult and all that, and California had been a state since 1850, Congress gave Yosemite to the state with specific mandate and instructions to keep it forever in public ownership. Uh, so the state actually managed Yosemite Valley for a few decades. And then they kind of did a lousy job of it and they gave it back to the feds. And so it, it is now a national park. It became a national park in the 1890s. But um, anyway, so you had these two national parks, Yellowstone, Yosemite. And then in the 1890s, about the same time the national forest system was created, Congress began designating more and more national parks. And in 1916, um, Congress established the National Park Service, and a, a federal agency to manage the parks, and created a national park system, and then has added to it uh, steadily over the years since. If I remember correctly, uh, Indiana Dunes became, I think, the 61st national park in 2018. Mm. It had been a national seashore before that, yeah. which was mm -hmm. kind of a different classification, but it became a full-fledged national park uh, in 2019. Mm hmm. Yeah. And um, obviously, you know, moving forward, uh, we, we have even more changes. Uh, you talk about the Bureau of Land Management uh, coming into play kind of uh, later in the 20th century. Uh, talk about how that changed things a little bit. Yeah, that was uh, as the parks and the forests and the wildlife refuge system were were being added to and growing in the first three decades of the, 19th, of the 20th century, uh, there were still a large amount of mostly very arid desert kind of public lands, mostly in the inner mountain west in the Great Basin, a um, couple hundred million acres. Um, and they were just sort of sitting there and uh, there was cattle grazing on them and, and kind of not much else, but they didn't have any particular status. And then the Dust Bowl came along um, in the 19, late 1920s, and then the Great Depression, and the cattle interests that were, livestock interests, mostly cattle, some sheep, that were using these lands, were going under, uh, basically. And uh, they went to the federal government and said, you know, the federal government ought to come in and take over these lands and manage them and, and you know, keep, keep our operations alive. And uh, and so the United States uh, basically said, OK, we'll do that. And they passed something called the Congress passed the Taylor Grazing Act in 1934. And then Franklin Roosevelt reserved all of these remaining lands uh, in national ownership permanently to um, uh, to restore them, basically, because they had been badly beaten up uh, from from all the grazing. Uh, and Congress eventually created uh, 
in the 1940s, 1946, uh, a, a new federal agency called the Bureau of Land Management uh, to manage those lands. And uh, that, has, that system has remained in place to this day. So the Bureau of Land Management is actually, in acreage terms, the largest single federal land managing agency. It manages more land than, than any other uh, agency. It's also the most obscure. Uh, very few people have uh, really heard of it, but it manages some really marvelous lands. And, uh, and Congress, um, uh, over the last 50 years, has really given the Bureau of Land Management um, a real nudge to, hey, manage these lands for conservation and recreation uh, and preservation, uh, just like you're managing the other lands. So one of the important modern stories about public lands is that these four big agencies that Congress over the years has given responsibility for managing the lands to, that's the Park Service, the United States Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Land Management, uh, has basically, in modern era, given all four of these agencies a very similar management mandate. Your primary job is to conserve these lands, to restore and protect the environment on these lands, to keep them open for recreation uh, and conservation purposes. Um, and that should, that's the primary way these lands are managed today, all of them, regardless of agency. So there's been kind of a gradual blurring of the distinctions among the agencies. There are some distinctions that still exist, but, but they're much less important than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you mentioned Alaska before, and, and I kind of think the same thing about when you look at the map you have in the book of where all the public lands are, uh, you look at some of these states and it's the, there's just these little parts that aren't public land. So it's just amazing to think that, you know, Nevada, you know, I, I've driven through Nevada before and, and there's just some places where it's like there's 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 signs off the highway where there's like no services. <laughs> if you if you exit here, there's nothing for you. <laughs> like can't do anything to help you. Um, it's just it's just amazing what uh, the you know, still it's just it's just it's a huge country that with no with, with no people on it for a lot of it. It's just an amazing and some of these states, like I said, it's just most of the state is is that it's just public lands. It's just amazing to think about. So. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, the uh, Nevada is uh, has the largest percentage of public mm -hmm. lands. I think it's eighty five percent or something like that of the acreage right. in the state is managed by the national government. Um, Alaska is a second. Uh, Alaska, Utah, around sixty percent, as I recall. Um, in California, where I live, it's forty four percent, quite quite a bit. Uh, so the big percentages tend to be in the West. Right. But there are quite a few public lands in other places. The Michigan, more than 10 percent of Michigan is public lands. Mm. I, th I think same is true of Minnesota. Uh, so uh, there are public lands scattered all over the country. Right, right. Definitely. Um, now, also out west, I know they uh, tested nuclear bombs uh, out in uh, some of these places. Right. And these were on public lands. Right. Or were yeah, these on well, military bases? Yeah, the big, the big testing right. site was in Nevada. Uh, okay. Yeah. It. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, is that uh, you know what what's the fallout from that? Because it seems like that it would still be harmful to be around. I, I don't know how much you go into this. I haven't got to this part of the book yet. No. To, well, to the, the, to the later the, part of the book. But, um, the one um, the one category of public lands that I don't deal with in the book in mm -hmm. any detail is military lands. I see. Um, okay. And uh, they're they're a relatively small percentage. I think it's probably three okay. or four percent, something like gotcha. that, of the total acreage. Okay. But that includes the Nevada test site. It's called, and that's I where see. the nuclear uh, tests were conducted. And that okay. is off limits for because right. for good reason. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 because uh, it is contaminated, and uh, um, and there have been proposals ongoing for gosh decades now to mm -hmm. site the uh, a high level nuclear waste disposal uh, facility there mm. at the Nevada test site to, to handle right. the waste from the nuclear uh, energy program, the civilian nuclear energy program, as well as from the, the military uh, nuclear program. But that is that is a very special category of federal lands. Yeah, <laughs> not accessible to the public for good reason. 
Uh, sure. And I don't, I really don't deal with it in my book. Okay. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but uh, what do you see kind of going forward here as we look to the future for public lands? What What do you see as um, the policies? You said this is kind of a, a contentious thing where it wasn't before. How do we kind of return to the idea that this is a common thing that we have uh, all together? Well, I think um, um, the you know, public land policy by and large is not itself contentious. Like I said, it's not, it's not really part of that partisan politics that we uh, are so accustomed to in the modern age. Uh, occasionally, for sure, uh, there are controversies about particular public lands that sort of make it to the national headlines. Uh, President Trump, for example, uh, drastically shrank a two big national monuments, two big national protected areas in southern Utah uh, in 2017. Uh, and that attracted some national headlines. Um, uh, but don't be fooled that the Trump administration was totally anti-public lands because President Trump actually signed into law some really important protection bills for for public lands. One of them protected about a million acres in southern Utah, very near the, the national monument that he shrank. So, uh, so it, it is still true that uh, public land policy, things get done in Congress uh, and in the executive uh, without, uh, things get done to protect, keep and hold and add to the public land base um, without a lot of controversy. Um, and so don't don't let those occasional disputes uh, that make it into the national news uh, paint the picture that this is all a big uh, war zone uh, in terms of uh, policy making because it's not. Uh, there is still a tremendous amount of uh, consensus on the general policy that the, we ought to keep these lands and protect these lands. L let me give you one more ex modern example. Actually, about 40 years ago, um, President Ronald Reagan was elected and came into office in his inaugural address, famously said, you know, government is not the solution to the problem. Government is the problem that the country faces. And uh, he appointed a, a libertarian who really didn't believe in public lands at all to be the interior secretary, who, who basically started to try to propose to sell off the lands and lease them, uh, all of them to oil and gas companies and that sort of thing and encountered a big backlash in the Congress, including the Senate, which was at that time controlled by the Republicans. So his, his interior secretary, James Watt, resigned, and Ronald Reagan actually tacked to the middle. I mean, he went, he saw the popularity of the public lands, and during his term of office, Ronald Reagan signed into law more bills that protected more acres of public lands as so-called wilderness, which is the most protective classification. Ronald Reagan signed more wilderness bills into law, protecting more acreage as wilderness in the lower 48 states than any president before him or after him. So um, he, um, um, again, illustrating the, the enduring popularity of, of public lands. Mm. Right, right. Well, uh, this is definitely an interesting subject, and I hadn't really given it the kind of thought that your book had before I read it. So uh, thank you for tackling it. It definitely uh, opened my eyes to a lot of things I hadn't thought about before. Um, Good. Well, that was uh, exactly my purpose. I want to well. enlighten people and tell them this, I think, great American story. The public lands are a wonderful American institution that people should know more about. Um, and so that's why I wrote the book. And thank you so much for having me on. Well, definitely. Um, one question I ask always before we go, though, is uh, what music have you been listening to lately? Oh, I listen to a lot of uh, jazz from the 40s and 50s, basically. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, tell me some. And, who, uh, who's your favorite artist from then? I like that, too. Yeah. Oh, you know, I love the piano players. I love uh, I love Oscar Peterson. I love Bill Evans. I love... Mm. Uh, I love the guitarist. I love Joe Pass. Uh, I think I could listen to Joe Pass and play play jazz on the guitar forever. Nice. Uh, that kind of stuff. I really cool. Like. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, uh, again, thank you for taking so much time tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, All right. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Thank Anytime. you. Have a, have a great night. Okay. You too. All right.
Bye bye. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.